Okay, let's do it. Thank you. Good to see you. What's the teddy bear for? I'll that's, tell part, you. that's part of the act, I see. Good evening. We're glad to be here. I was prepared to be intimidated this evening for all sorts of uh, reasons, such as following somebody whose computer didn't crash. I've brought mine and I've been concerned about that all day long, having to rebuild my system earlier today. Um, and I was concerned about maybe following somebody who um, had cooler technology to show than what I was going to be showing you this evening. I wasn't prepared for following a magician, so it's a whole different set of um, intimidations that I'm dealing with up here. So I brought my teddy along <laughs> and was happy to have um, been provided that, I presume, for this occasion. Um, <laughs> I've actually dabbled a little bit in magic myself, which has made the whole thing a little bit uh, more intimidating. <laughs> and the comments that we've just heard have uh, caused me to reflect a little bit upon um, what it is in my career in music and dealing with new technologies that's um, given me a little bit of an edge and enabled me to have a rather exciting career, I think. And that is that I've discovered that I'm not really all that smart necessarily with new technology, but I got into it a little bit on the early side, and I frequently find that I know just this much more than some of my colleagues in the musical field, and f for them, what I do often seems like magic, and for me, it's just that little bit of an edge that's given me some exciting opportunities to, uh, to get involved with new equipment and so forth. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Disclavier piano that's uh, made by Yamaha and my work with it. I know everybody here has at least a passing interest in technology. I'm kind of curious as to how many actually play a musical instrument. Quite a good number. How many actually play the piano? Fair number of those too. Good. Well, uh, given uh, such familiarity with music, I'd like to start with just with a little bit of an analogy. Uh, in music, uh, there's a phenomenon, an oral phenomenon, uh, known as a modulation, when a piece changes key. A piece might start out in the key of G, that's the tonal center, may go to D or A or some other key. And one way that composers get from one key to another is by use of a pivot chord. And a pivot chord is simply a chord that exists in the old key and in the new key. It has one function in the old key and a different function in the new key. And the interesting thing about a pivot chord in a modulation is, is that the unsuspecting listener hears that pivot chord, doesn't realize that a modulation is taking place until some beats or measures after and suddenly realizes, oh, we're in a different key. And you, then you can trace it retrospectively back to that, that moment, that pivot chord. Well, I kind of think of uh, 1988, um, in this country anyway, when the disc clavier was introduced as being sort of a pivot chord moment in the evolution of the piano. A lot of people didn't know what to make of the disc clavier. Candidly, I'm not sure what the engineers had in mind when they created it. But I do know this, that a lot of people would typically come home from work and relax and unwind with their teddy, look at their watch, realize it was five, time for a drink, and that's a good way to conclude the day. Uh, there were some more forward-thinking people, however, who had encountered the disc clavier and realized that alcohol wasn't enough. And for them to be unwind, um, meant looking at their watch, realizing it was time to push the play button and have some entertainment. stop it there at that moment. And that was great. Um, spending, oh, depending on what size disc clavier you bought, if it was a small grand, 20,000, if it was a big one, maybe 40, 50, 60,000, 
on a piano that could do that. That was pretty cool. And um, that created a whole um, new genre of, of, of personality that often referred to as sort of the music potato. Uh, somebody who could <laughs> come home and turn on their piano. And, you know, some of my musical colleagues would look down a little bit on that concept. I see nothing wrong with music potatoes. I mean, uh, we need to have somebody who's willing to, um, um, uh, to work with the things that we offer in music. And geez, I could be the person making these discs and records that, that people would listen to. So I thought that was great. Um, but it was interesting to find out just what other kinds of reactions other people had to the instrument. Um, I know that some people looked at it and said, well, that's kind of a cool poltergeist effect. And <laughs> Actually, it is. Um, it's been used in movies uh, many different times. It was used um, in The Preacher's Wife, for example, a fairly uh, contemporary movie, and literally as a poltergeist uh, effect. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. I was involved in a poltergeist effect uh, just at the beginning of January of this year with the piano, having worked with Keith Lockhart and the Boston Pops Orchestra. Uh, 1998 is the centennial year of uh, George Gershwin's birth, and the Pops wanted to do something a little bit interesting. And they knew that George Gershwin had recorded a piano roll version of Rhapsody in Blue back in the 20s. And someone uh, had taken that uh, piano roll data and converted it to the kind of data that I'll be explaining to you a little bit more later that works with this instrument. And they wanted to, to have George Gershwin basically return to the concert stage 60-some years after his death and play Rhapsody in Blue with the Boston Pops Orchestra. Uh, there were some technical issues involved. The piano roll that uh, he had recorded, uh, he had made a special arrangement um, which included the notes of the piano solo as well as orchestra notes mixed in. In some cases, he kind of rearranged the parts so he could play everything himself. In other cases, it would appear as though maybe he made uh, two passes in the recording process because there are more notes there than one person could actually play. Uh, so I went through the pro interesting process on the computer of uh, editing out all the uh, orchestra notes and um, trying to fix things up so we were left with a piano solo version that was recorded by George Gershwin and uh, Keith Lockhart uh, conducted the Boston Pops. It was a quirky performance because the piano roll was very quirky with some very strange tempo changes that happened very rapidly. Uh, but it worked out uh, very well and it was a lot of fun. So the poltergeist effect is uh, certainly a valid uh, application of the instrument. But I was always disappointed um, in the uh, early 90s in the reaction of some of my um, music colleagues to the instrument. Uh, many people would look at it for the first time, particularly if they saw it in a, in a shopping mall uh, or some such place or in a hotel lounge and say, wow, trying to put pianists out of work. Um, who needs to learn how to play the piano anymore, that sort of thing. And that kind of comment that discouraged me because I'm a piano teacher. I'm on the faculty of New England Conservatory Prep School. I have a studio in my home in Newton Center, Massachusetts, and I've dedicated my adult life to training, training another generation of musicians. I have no interest in putting people out of work, but I do teach on a seven-foot uh, disc clavier piano. Well, my, I saw this instrument for the first time. I, added my voice to the voice of uh, a number of other people who were similarly interested in it and asked some basic questions like, well, gee, can you record yourself on this instrument? And the answer is yes. Well, if that's the case, could I, if I was preparing a recital, record myself and then go sit out there and, and hear what I sound like from the point of view of the audience? Well, yes, you can do that. Um, if my playing is sort of uneven, um, could I change the tempo, maybe slow it down and examine in detail how I played? Well, yes, we can do that. I'll show you how that's done in a moment. Well, then I start to thinking, well, supposing I wanted to, um, to make a CD. What does a pianist typically do? A pianist goes into the recording studio and um, plays each section of a Beethoven sonata 10 times and lets the recording engineer take the best take of each one and splice them all together and create a performance that actually had never existed. Uh, well, couldn't I, with this instrument, maybe perform in front of a live audience with all the nervous excitement that goes into that, and then after the audience is gone, edit that on a computer to clean up the two or three notes that I might have played wrong in an hour's concert, and um, <laughs> then bring in the microphones and record a corrected live performance? Well, sure, you can do that. And I asked some other questions. Well, couldn't you uh, connect this instrument, since it has this thing on it called MIDI, uh, to a personal computer, and instead of putting up manuscript paper on the, 
on the music desk and composing and writing on the, uh, on the paper by hand, couldn't you just play your new composition and have it pop up as notes on the computer screen? And well, once again, the answer was yes. So um, I saw this um, device when it came out as, as more than just a, um, an entertainment tool for the music potato. Um, it was also a, an incredible professional tool uh, that I have um, been rewarded by being able to use on a daily basis. So uh, how does the instrument work? To start with, I think it's uh, important to put it into an historical context. All musical instruments have undergone considerable technology uh, changes and innovations uh, during their history. And the same is true with, with the piano. Back in the early 1700s, there were keyboards called harpsichords uh, in which you could play a note and that would cause a pin to pluck a string and no matter how hard you struck the key, the pin would always pull the string back the same distance and make it vibrate. Uh, it was a nice instrument. It was the centerpiece of the budding orchestra that was evolving at the time. Um, but it had the problem that you really couldn't play loud versus soft. Everything was always the same volume. There was another instrument that took a different approach. You press a key and a little uh, pin or a piece of metal called a tangent would hit the string and cause it to vibrate. And uh, that instrument was called the clavichord. The problem with it, however, was, was that it uh, was very soft. You could never have a clavichord concert in the hall even this big. You wouldn't hear it very well in the back. So if you had taken that instrument and tried to put a big heavy hammer on it to try to generate a big sound, the problem would be that that hammer would hit the string, immediately cause it to start vibrating and immediately damp the string from vibrating also, defeating the purpose of having pressed the key in the first place. So a uh, rather smart guy named Bartolomeo Cristofori in 1709 uh, came up with this idea of an escapement action, such that you press the key and the hammer would pop up and hit the string, but by the time it hit the string, it had totally lost contact with the key, and even though you held the key down, the hammer would be able to fall back so the string could freely vibrate. Well, that escapement action made possible the um, the building of this new device called the Grave Cembalo Cal Forte Piano, the grand keyboard with soft and loud, or loud and soft. Um, and that instrument was shown to Johann Sebastian Bach in around 1738. He didn't like it, and the poor guy who built it named Silverman uh, was highly depressed and went back and worked on it for another uh, 10 years or 11 years or so, and finally showed it again to Bach just before uh, Bach's death in 1750. And at that point, uh, Bach gave it its, his approval and improvised a five-voice fugue on it um, to, uh, to so honor it. But of course, it took a long time before it ended up being this instrument. Uh, in early Mozart's day, it didn't even have pedals. There were knee levers, and then they finally gave way to pedals. Then people like Beethoven came along and demanded more notes, and so we finally got more notes. And he wanted more sound, and we finally got a steel frame. There's now 40,000 pounds of string tension that are inside the modern piano to make it what it is. So the piano has continued to evolve, and interestingly, in the teens and 20s of our own century, a phenomenon um, came up called the player piano, and I'm sure this is uh, not strange to anybody here. This is just a, a piano roll from that era. This is actually Swanee, played by George Gershwin, and it actually represents early um, computer code for music. The uh, holes uh, are either there or they're not there, so we have information that's either in the on or the off position. Uh, unfortunately, the information on the piano roll was, was rather limited. There were rolls that had so-called expression information on them, and you can listen to performances on a player piano by, you know, Rachmaninoff and Horowitz and other people of that era, and that plays back expressively, but you might not know that when they recorded those pieces, the recording instruments did not record any expression at all that was added editorially by, um, in a very labor-intensive process by the, the editors after the fact. Well, the, the um, depression killed off, the, for the most part, the piano roll industry, although it survives a little bit today. And as I say, in 1988, this new instrument came into being. And it's a recording instrument. When you play, Every time you press a note down, a hammer goes and hits a string, and there's a little shank or a little um, piece of metal on the hammer shank 
that goes into an optical chamber that measures the speed of the hammer uh, just before the moment it hits the string. That speed is captured as a form of data called MIDI data that probably many or most of you are familiar with. And um, that makes it possible on playback for this key lever to have a solenoid underneath that pops the back up, which makes the front go down. And that's what happens when you see it play. Many people look at it when they see it playing for the first time and wonder what's pulling those keys down. It's actually something pushing the back up. So um, how do we work with it? All I'm going to do is push the record button. The play button is now blinking at me. I'll push the play button. It beeps to tell me that it's engaged. And then, unlike a tape recorder, it's just in waiting mode. And again, unlike a tape recorder, it's not going to be recording any audio information. It's only going to be recording my actions at the keyboard and storing those actions for uh, future playback. so forth. I'll just press the stop button. I'll get a message on the display telling me the information is being written to disk. Then either by pushing the play button or a handheld remote or my favorite device, my wristwatch, I can ask it to play back. Now, oh, thank you. Maybe I said thank you too soon. I don't know if you were applauding me or the piano. Um, we shouldn't get confused about those things. Um, if you could put my computer on the screen, I'd be grateful. A lot of ways to exchange information these days. Um, no doubt you recognize my um, web browser up here. I've logged on to a website called the Classical MIDI Archives and had specifically um, gone through and um, looked for the page for Claude Debussy. He's the composer of the piece that I had just played. And I'll click on Arabesque number one. As you can see, there's four different examples of that piece that happened to be on this website. And this information just being loaded into my browser, and I'll be able to play that out of my browser on the piano. I was recently attending the um, Music Library Association convention in Boston, and we were showing the disc clavier there as a research tool. And um, it was very interesting to be able to have some discussions about music, and then right there at our fingertips over the internet, live performances available on the piano. It became an interesting thing to be able to compare my playing to uh, the playing of that, of that gentleman. How many preferred my playing? <laughs> Glad to know you know the right answers here. Uh, a question before I proceed. How am I doing on the time? Uh, just a few more minutes. Just a few more minutes. Okay. Um, then what I'm going to do is to 
go to one of the many extensions that you can make uh, from the disk clavier by virtue of the fact that you can connect uh, with your personal computer. I've had the very fortunate experience, and this is really one of the highlights of my um, professional life, to have been involved as a business partner and co-developer with a very fine pianist and computer programmer named Frank Weinstock, who's the head of the um, piano department at the conservatory at the University of Cincinnati. And he's developed a wonderful score tracking technology. And basically what that means is you can load in a music file in this MIDI data format into the computer and you can play and it will match what you're playing to the notes that you're expected to play in the file. And then if it's something like a piano concerto, let's say, and there's supposed to be a full orchestra there because it knows where you are and how fast you're going and you're changing tempo and with your louder soft, it can output an accompaniment that gets faster, slower, louder, softer, and so forth. Um, and the possibility here is really to integrate all of these things and make the technology become really quite transparent. And as far as I'm concerned, when I'm working with it, I'm just playing a real piano with hammers and strings. It may be in tune, it may not be in tune. It's just the usual piano experience. But all these wonderful things have been added to it. Now, the program, which is just being uh, released, really, as we speak, called Cakewalk in Concert, is up there on the screen. But before I play it for you, let me just give you the experience that normally one would have if you took one of these so-called ensemble music files and put it into the disk drive of the disk clavier. Uh, you would be able to hear a whole orchestra playing along with the piano part. It's a little piece called Clarinet Blues. Gives a little metronome to tell you the tempo. Now the disc clavier has buttons for left and right hands, which means that I can cancel the piano part, and so I get to play along. There's no doubt about that, and I use these kinds of discs with my students all the time, and issues of counting go away, issues of playing in time go away. They're highly motivated to play with an accompaniment. It's just a wonderful thing. But ultimately, I don't want to teach my students to play like metronomes. I want them to play musically, and musically means out of time sometimes. So uh, let me just make sure that I have adjusted my uh, settings here on the disc clavier uh, for this purpose. And, um, what I should be able to do is to, to be set up here and without thinking about pushing buttons and so forth, just start playing and manipulate the accompaniment. And while I'm doing it, since you may not know the piece very well, you might want to keep your eye on current tempo up here and uh, tempo percentage and you'll see how it's changing uh, as I play. I realize my time has come. I've 
brought along my own exit music. So if you give me just a moment to load up 30 more seconds of music, I'll uh, prepare my exit. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the spooky thing about this has been I've often worked on a piano concerto. Uh, I've got one orchestra I found in the world that will play with me every summer. Uh, just so happens to be conducted by my dad in Rockford, Illinois. Um, <laughs> but the result is that I work on a new piano concerto every year. And with this technology, I have this wonderful experience of just being able to sit down and work on my concerto and play. And I stop, and the music stops, and I go have lunch, and then I come back, and I start playing again. And suddenly, there's this orchestra again. And I um, um, haven't had to pay union rates or anything. It's great. Uh, but it's all to prepare me to play with the real guys uh, when I have the chance.